Hi, my name is Aliza Sperling. I'm the director of Her Torah, which is a program of Sviva. Sviva was founded by Ariella Mortkowitz, and it's about creating a more nourishing and communal faith experience for Jewish women, where we define both Jewish and women very broadly. If you want to be with us, we want you with us and welcome. We are multi-generational and diverse in background and affiliations. We come together in celebration and support of women, our strengths, our unique perspectives, and our ways of contributing to the world. Her Torah is a Sviva program that brings women of all backgrounds together to learn Jewish texts, to talk about the things that mean, that are so important to us. And uh, part of her Torah and part of the joy of her Torah is bringing together fascinating teachers of Torah who can guide us and who can open us up to different ways of looking at the world. Her Torah is so thankful to Yeshivat Maharat for your partnership and to the Aviv and Covenant Foundation for your faith in our work. This month of Elul, we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of coming together, well, pre-COVID it was in person, and now during COVID it's been online on Zoom. But now for the month of Elul, the month before Rosh Hashanah, we are interviewing wonderful Jewish women leaders and teachers who are giving us a glimpse into what they think about during this holiday time. We're so glad to have you with us today to hear from Dr. Naomi Gromit, who I have to confess is, is a friend from many, many years ago, and it's really a pleasure to be with you, Naomi. Um, it is a real pleasure to be with you, Elisa. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to listen to more of our interviews, please sign up for the Sviva email list at sviva.org. That's S-V-I-V-A-H dot org and follow us on Facebook and Instagram so that you don't miss any of these wonderful speakers. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my friend, Dr. Naomi Marvin Grummet. Naomi is the founder and director of the Eden Center in Jerusalem, which is a nonprofit organization that works to improve the experience of mikvah and sees the mikvah as a platform to promote the physical, emotional, spiritual, and sexual health of Jewish women and families. Naomi holds a PhD in sociology from Bar Ilan University and has published numerous articles. She lives in Jerusalem with her husband and three children. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you so much, Elisa. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Naomi, I have so many questions for you. Um, you're really a wealth of information. Um, you have had so many conversations with women about their experience of going to the mikvah, of um, thinking about Jewish women um, and their sexual experiences, which is kind of like a, a taboo topic often, and you've really managed to break through that taboo and, and um, really think about what women are going through and what they need. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about the Eden Center? So the Eden Center was really created um, based on the stories of so many women that shared with me and others over time about their experience of Mecca and what it means. And when I heard stories um, from a lot of different people, I understood that Mikva is really a focal point that brings together a lot of different areas of life. It relates to how we think about ourselves um, as Jewish women, about our bodies, how we relate to sexuality, how we think about ourselves in relationship, going to the mikvah specifically, also given the time of month that you go, also obviously makes us think about the physical processes that, and the changes that we go through, and also, where are we and what do we want and hope for in the realm of fertility? And the Eden Center tries to bring all of those things together and use Mikvah as a platform to enhance our ability to talk about it as a community. All of those different things that we as women often don't talk about or are often taboo, but how do we relate to? A, how to make Mikvah as an experience better, more welcoming, more accessible for all of us. But also, how do we think about, and as a Jewish community, how do we provide resources 
um, for the conversations around our physical, emotional, spiritual, and sexual health. That's really what we do on a day to day. And, you know, coming up to Rosh Hashanah, um, I think those things are so relevant when we're thinking about ourselves over the past year and going forward. You know, it's not just about have I done enough or what, what am I in the spiritual realm, but also how do I relate to myself um, as a being that has so many complex aspects? Um, Eden is trying to bring those conversations together. Do I give myself space to appreciate my body? Do I take care of my mental health while I'm taking care of so many other things in my purview and in my life? Um, and, you know, my sexual relationship also contributes to my overall health and just really creating a platform for those conversations. So I invite people to learn more about that conversation by looking at many of the things that we've put out at the Eden Center, theedencenter.com is where people can take a look. That's fantastic. Okay. I have so many questions for you, Naomi. Um, and I love the way that you've really made me think about, I guess, traditionally, we think about coming to our Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur services and really thinking about our spiritual health. Um, and that's a wonderful forum for thinking about that. But what, where are the places where we think about all these other things? Um, and, and even to be cognizant about the idea the fact that we need to be thinking about those things. We need to kind of do those annual reviews, not just spiritually, but for the other parts of us. So I'll tell you that from my point of view, when I think about um, Chazal, you know, the, the, the rabbis throughout the generations and the, the sages, men and women, who, uh, but men mainly, who said um, that we have to build a mikvah before we build other communal institutions, to me, after you know having so many conversations, it became very clear to me that the reason that they say that we should build a mikvah in a community first is exactly to create the space for those kind of conversations. And to say that your physical intimate relationship, that you're having the time to be in touch with yourself, those have to come front and center. Your intimate physical relationship with your partner, that is what builds a community. And all of those things that I think Mikva can provide for a person who has it as part of their life cycle ritual, um, or hopefully can provide, is what really um, our sages wants it for us to be able to do. And so Rosh Hashanah is one time when we can access that. But for those who go on a regular basis, being able to tap into any one part of that, you know, my sexuality, my, my relationship with my body, my physical, my question of my fertility and what's going on, all of those things I think are things that we should come back to. And that by saying this has to be front and center, um, Chazal, we're saying is important, um, is, you know, the foundational for us. So I want to come back to so many of those things, but it'll probably have to be in a later conversation because right now let's talk about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, let's start with Rosh Hashanah. You talked about people's fertility journeys and uh, Rosh Hashanah can be really hard. First of all, it's a day when you're sitting in synagogue or wherever you are and you're thinking about the year and what happened that you wanted and what happened that you didn't want. And for people, who are struggling with fertility, that can be a really tough time. Uh, and especially in terms of the Torah readings that we have for Rosh Hashanah, which often focus on Sarah's infertility or Hannah's infertility, can be so painful. Yeah, I definitely, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I have so many times related to the fact that those are moments that for many, many women and couples are very, very challenging um, sitting and here and being reminded. And I have to say that in general, um, you know, the space of Chagim, of our holidays, which are so family oriented and so revolve around 
being together with family and children, et cetera, et cetera, and extended family can really be a difficult space for people who are struggling. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and to recognize and be sensitive to the woman sitting next to us in shul or wherever we are, um, that she might be going through that. Um, and I see it as a space that, you know, Rosh Hashanah brings up those things, just like I have to say, going to the mikvah as a space for fertility often brings up the same kind of feelings. For many women there is, uh, who are going through a fertility struggle, there's a, it's, it's very difficult and there's a lot of sadness or a lot of even a sense of failure at, you know, this is what we're, is kind of expected and what I want and I'm not achieving it or I'm not being successful or what am I doing wrong? Why is God punishing me? There are all those questions that kind of come together. Um, and I think, first of all, recognizing that it is a deep struggle. Secondly, um, the Eden Center has put together and Sviva is a partner in this, a beautiful booklet called Birkat Emuna um, for women and couples who are going through fertility challenges that has within it different prayers, um, meditations, a mindfulness piece um, that can be used in the mikvah or otherwise, and women's poetry and prose that they've written um, connecting. I, I think that the most beautiful part for me is women today who've written their own prayers mm -hmm. that we've included, some of which are in conversation with traditional prayers and Hannah's prayer, which is you know, something that we read in shul is one of those traditional prayers that oftentimes actually really gives people comfort by knowing that we're not the first to struggle with something, but that there's actually a traditional, I, I, it's beautiful that in our communal prayers, our tefillot actually include and do recognize that struggle as being a struggle that's an age old struggle um, which unfortunately isn't always answered. And we don't always, you know, it's, it's even more painful when there isn't a positive answer at the end of, mm -hmm. yes, now you're pregnant and you're having a baby. Um, but Birkat Emuna tries to link into the same um, spiritual uh, stra strand that um, we see in the Tefillot of Rosh Hashanah of grounding us in the age old prayers and coming to where we are today, um, being able to at least give voice and hopefully find comfort in that struggle through through the Tfilo modern and and uh, and ancient. That's wonderful. I'm really looking forward to it coming out and including it maybe in my Rosh Hashanah Mahsar prayer book. Um, we are too. We're, the, it's what it is going to arrive in people's uh, I don't know, communities and shuls and, and in the Sviva community after Rosh Hashanah for during October and during these got infertility awareness month. Um, so look out for it. That's great. Thank you. Okay, now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about Yom Kippur. Um, so I hear that you're going to tell us a little bit about this ancient practice of women immersing right before Yom Kippur. Right. So when you first um, asked me about what are the things that I think about during this time and, you know, how do we try to uh, or how do I personally try to connect um, during this time? One of the things that's been most meaningful for me over the last few years was reinstating in my family and for myself a practice that, as you said, is very ancient. It goes back to the ninth well, at least the ninth century, because it's already mentioned mm -hmm. um, by Rav Amram Gaon um, as being a practice. And that is, many communities are familiar with men immersing in the mikvah before Yom Kippur as part of their spiritual preparation. But as I mentioned, Rav Amram Gaon already talks about the fact that women also go to the mikvah as part of their preparation for Yom Kippur. And what I think about is how it's actually a whole body expression of my desire to be in the process of tshuva and to come into Yom Kippur, not only having gone through a mental process of assessing where I am, but physically taking myself and making a statement 
with my whole body that I am in the process, that I want to be, that I am putting myself in, you know, the mikvah represents the wellspring of God's presence and the power, the creative powers in the world and the ability to renew and create constantly. The mikvah is filled with waters that have to be natural. And in a sense, they, they connect straight back to the waters of the six days of creation. They, they have to be natural water that is gathered um, from rain or from ice or snow that comes to the world, uh, which it, right now we've had such an abundance. And sometimes that abundance does not seem like a blessing, yes, but it is to remind us um, of God's hand in the world. Of God's hand in creation and an ongoing presence of God through the rain in our lives. One of the few things that we don't control. Um, and so for me, coming to the mikvah before Yom Kippur really puts me in the mindset of my teshuva process, my repentance and my process of assessing where I am in life is not just abstinence. It's not just, you know, culminating in not eating and not drinking and not whatever, but it also is an active statement of wanting to be there as a whole person um, with all of me and connecting to those, those forces that the mikvah represents. And I think it is really also a beautiful time um, the reason that I found it actually transformational is because um, the the sources say that it's also a time for girls and single women to go, actually women of all ages and stages of life, married, divorced, um, single, you, you know, young and old can go to the mikvah in the era of Yom Kippur. And for us, it's been transformational because um, whereas mikvah is usually thought of for married women um, in, you know, around their menstrual cycle, this immersion is an immersion for everybody that doesn't connect to that at all. And it, for me, was a beautiful opportunity to teach my children about the tradition of mikvah in a completely non-sexualized way, hmm. but just being able to discuss with them what are the spiritual powers that the mikvah hmm. represents? What is the, the fact that there is sort of a embodiment not, not exactly, but of God's presence in the world. We don't have a Beit HaMikdash anymore. But we, we don't have a temple anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have that connection that we go on Sukkot or on Pesach to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. But we have the mikvah, which represents that collection of God's power in the world. Um, and that's a way that we can connect. So for my kids, it's amazing. They love it. They wait for it every year. Wow, that's amazing. And I guess on a practical note, you have mikvahs in Jerusalem that will open up on the day before Yom Kippur and allow, and let everybody in? Yes. So in Israel in general, there are women's mikvahs and men's mikvahs. Some communities in America have women's mikvahs and men's mikvahs. Some don't, and some have one mikvah for the community and everybody uses it. And usually they will have times for men to go and times for women to go. And if you can't go on the day of um, Kol Nidre, of the day of, that Yom Kippur starts, then you can go the night before or two nights before. Usually people try to go the night before, um, you know, as part of that process, which is, Totally fine. So in, even in communities where men are using the mikvah during the day, um, women can go the night before and still connect to the same ideas. So, it, you know, I'll explain to you because this is something that the Eden Center has been promoting, um, mm -hmm. both because it's a woman's tradition that has largely been lost in our communities, and also because it's a beautiful way to connect with your children to this incredible spiritual power. Um, I'd love to outline, if it's okay, some of the do's and don'ts. Oh yeah, I'd love to hear it. So first of all, for those who are familiar with mikvah in general, 
Um, usually when we go to the mikvah, there's a lot of preparation that's needed. We have to remove any extraneous, um, any external barriers that would separate between our body and the water. But for Erev Yom Kippur, we don't have to do that. We bring ourselves um, it's nice to take a shower before we get there mm -hmm. to respect the other people who will then be going in. Yeah. But we don't have to actually do any physical preparation because this is a spiritual um, ritual. And we don't have to, some people know that there is a mikvah attendant who usually accompanies us when we go to the mikvah. So on Erev Yom Kippur, there is no intermediary of any kind. There's no mikvah attendant. You go into the water for your own spiritual process without anybody there. As it's only a custom and not a mitzvah, like going at the end of a, of a menstrual cycle, we also don't say a bracha. Um, so some people think, oh, well, how does, you know, how does it transform me? So the, the, um, the act of putting your body into the water in and of itself is the spiritual um, transformation. And going into the mikveh is an act of spiritual transformation. It's not a physical transformation. It is connecting on a spiritual level, but with your whole body. And that's why I like to frame um, mikveh. Usually there's a tradition of immersing three times mm -hmm. for this specific um, immersion, even if you do something else when you go other times, the tradition is that women who go on Erev Yom Kippur will immerse three times. So I think it's actually very beautiful. Um, we sort of created this framework to help us to focus our thought during that time of immersion. And I think also, I know that at least for my kids, but for many other kids um, and families that we've helped to take on this practice, it's really helpful to think about your immersion, each immersion having its own special focus. The first one being a focus on the past, being on where am I coming from? What have I accomplished in the last year? What are the things that I wanna improve on? And sort of you know taking stock, but using that time to do it in a very focused way. The second immersion is an immersion of the present. Where am I right now? What am I thankful for? What am I looking forward to? But really accepting what it is, where I am right now in my life. And the third is looking forward. Where do I want to be next year? What are the things that I want to work on? What are the things that I want to keep in my life? And what are the things that I want to, to begin to move away from or to, to go through my process of leaving those behind with the previous year. And if we are able to focus on past, present, and future, that can really help us to go through the process of teshuva, of repentance from in a very practical way. Um, I love that. And um, even for people who can't make it to the mikvah, it's a nice framework even with, you know, deep breaths or, or um, giving yourself, you know, some time during the service for the past, some time for the present and some time for the future. That's really helpful. Yep. And you should just know that even in um, modern halacha books that talk about this as a custom, there is actually an idea that you can even take a shower an extended shower because the idea of the water is still purifying in that sense. Oh, wow. So you can certainly do it when you're in a shul, when you're in synagogue, you can break up your thoughts. But if you want to, it is not the same, but you can use a shower as a time to still think about this spiritual transformation. I, I love this and I'm so curious as to what they do in my community. I'm going to have to check and see. Um, thank you for this really beautiful way of, of adding a ritual, um, like a really a beautiful ritual that's not usually extended to the whole family, right? And then uh, on the eve of Yom Kippur to really be able to share that. And I'm, I'm gonna go and check and see if I can do that here. 
I hope you'll be able to. It's a really beautiful thing. And, uh, and you know, I, my son has gone with my husband for many years and my daughter has come with me. My daughters have come with me and it creates a totally different um, environment coming into Yom Kippur, sort of having gone through this together. But I will say that I think it's different for people who started when their daughters were young yeah. than for people who are going with their teens, you know, um, because teens have their own ways of uh, taking on things or, you know, wanting to do what their parents are doing or not yes. to offer as a possibility without um, no coercion. I have no coercion. <laughs> Neil, we thank you so much for this really fascinating, inspiring look at, at mikvah and the ways to think about it in like a totally new way. Um, uh, please, everybody who's listening, follow the Eden Center at theedencenter.com and follow the on Facebook and Instagram, Merkaz Eden. Great. And, uh, and look out for Birkat Emuna when it comes with Sviva's partnership in October. Fantastic. And does Birkat Emuna have an English translation? Um, an English nope. video? Okay, so we'll, we'll have to think. It is the that. English. Okay, but it is available in English. This is an English booklet, resource, okay, but it is still called Birkat Emuna. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Naomi. Thank you to everybody who's listening. Shana Tova, Mituka. Happy, healthy, sweet new year to everyone. Please, uh, if you'd like to listen and watch more of these interviews, please sign up at sviva.org. Thanks so much, Naomi. Thank you, Eliza. And thank you, Sviva and Ariel also.